We're here inside the Spruce Goose with Larry Wood, who's the Director of Education for the Evergreen Aviation and Space Museum. Larry, let's start talking about this plane by talking about its name, because I understand Howard Hughes hated that name. Oh yeah, it's not made out of spruce, first of all. It's made out of birch. And uh, Howard Hughes hated that. Flying the lumberyard was no better. He called it a Hercules. And of course, the original idea was from Henry Kaiser, so it would have been an HK-1. But when Mr. Kaiser dropped out of the project in about 1943, and Howard continued, then it became an H-4, the fourth airplane from the Hughes Corporation. And uh, Howard called it Hercules. When you look around inside this thing, everything is painted in a color that looks very much like zinc chromate green. And you see what looks you know, at a distance like rivets in some places, but you, then you do a double take and you walk up and this is all wood in here. Yes, 96% of the structure of the airplane's wood, and it's mostly birch duramold, which is the same wood used in the uh, Mosquito, a World War II British airplane. And it's painted with a special paint, a special varnish. Birch itself is very resistant to dry rot, and of course, painting with the varnish helped it keep it from rotting, and, and has actually preserved it very well. Remember, it's 60 years since the airplane flew, 62 to be exact. So it's not exactly a new piece of equipment. And it does shine because of the varnish on it. It was nailed together uh, until the glue set, and then the nails were removed, which saved about 7,000 pounds of weight, which is kind of, you think about 7,000 pounds of nails? Yeah. Well, everything about this is in, in a huge scale. Um, tell us what some of the unique innovations were in a plane this size that were unusual for the era. Well, obviously, it, just its sheer size, 320-foot wingspan from tip to tip is bigger than any wingspan on any airplane ever. The fuselage is just about the same size lengthwise and width as a 747. So the sheer magnitude of the project is amazing. It's hydraulically powered. The flight controls are hydraulically powered from the nose all the way to the tail to move the elevator, uh, and the elevator weighs 2,200 pounds. You're not gonna do that with muscle, so it's, it's a, a low pressure system of only 1,500 PSI, but it is hydraulically powered. And also the ailerons, which are half the length of the wings, are powered against the 150 knot airfoil and our airflow over the top of them. So it's not, you're not gonna do that by muscle. Cirrus Design's Vision SJ50 single engine personal jet offers exceptional fuel efficiency, flexible seating for up to seven, advanced avionics, and all the Cirrus safety features you expect, including the Cirrus airframe parachute system. With its V-tail design, the Cirrus Vision is technologically advanced, yet engineered to be simple to fly, to allow owner pilots more lifestyle pursuits than any other personal aircraft. Learn more about the Vision SJ50 at cirrusdesign.com. It's definitely Mr. Hughes' uh, life project, I think. It, it, it was, it's closely associated with him because he was the chief engineer. So all the ideas in here are his. The government wouldn't let him use aluminum. They said use wood. He couldn't use airplane uh, mechanics or airplane uh, manufacturers. He had to use carpenters. He trained his own engineers, and he was the chief engineer. So I think that's the biggest innovation. It was designated by the American Society of Mechanical Engineers as an engineering artifact, I think is the right word. Anyway, it's one of the seven uh, mechanical engineering marvels of the world, and you're standing in it. Tell us about the power plants, because these were used on some other aircraft, but this one has eight of them, and just the horsepower, the cubic inches, the fuel burn are all just okay. mind-boggling. There are 4360s, that's a radial 4360 is the number of cubic inches, so there are four banks of seven cylinders. They're not the biggest radial ever built, but they're certainly the most, uh, uh, the one that was used the most. There are eight on the airplane, I like to tease middle school kids, what's uh, four times seven, 28, two spark plugs per cylinder, 56, eight engines, 448 spark plugs, and they never get the last answer. So it's fun to pick on them about that. They're huge, they're supercharged, uh, 3,000 horsepower each. They weigh about 2,000 pounds apiece. And they were used on uh, KC-97s, the late model B-29s, B-50s, B-36s. And of course, those of you who are Vietnam era people like me, C-124 is old and shaky. He had the same engine. All right, now, a lot of people said this thing would never fly. And it seems as though once World War II was over and the original premise for building the plane was also over, this became sort of a personal... Uh, thing for Howard Hughes to prove to the world that, that this thing was capable of getting off the ground or off the water. 
Well, in 1947, Howard was called in front of Congress and was very severely criticized, saying that he'd wasted the government's money. He was kind of upset by that because, you know, it was a $16 million government contract. He had $9 million of his own put into the project. And there were $2.2 .2 billion worth of outstanding contracts in 1947. And he's like, why are you picking on me about $16 million? I put the sweat of my life into this thing. I have my reputation rolled up in it. And I have stated several times that if it's a failure, I'll probably leave this country and never come back, and I mean it. He wanted to fly the airplane to prove everybody was wrong, because he knew it would fly. And so he did, and he flew it well before I think he was ready to fly it, certainly before anybody else was ready for him to fly it. On the 2nd of November, he pulled it out, taxied around in, in Long Beach Harbor to do a taxi test, and then turned it into the wind, accelerated to 90 miles an hour, which gets the airplane up on its step, seaplanes have to like a hydroplane before they can lift off and then he said uh, okay we're going to do that again and this time as he turned into the wind he asked for 15 degrees of flaps and the only reason to put the flaps down is if you're going to fly so I think he astounded everybody I'm not sure that he didn't make the decision to fly as he turned into the wind took off flew less than one mile less than one minute 70 feet is the altitude they say and I don't know if that's from the cockpit to the water or from the bottom of the airplane to the water. It doesn't look like 70 feet below the airplane in the videos. And there are lots of reasons why only that far. Most likely he was going to have to land on the other side of the seawall and he didn't want to do that. It would have been in the open ocean. But there are other reasons which nobody can really confirm. 29 people on the airplane, no life preservers. That may have factored into it too. Integra Release 9 sets a new standard with the easiest to use pilot interface in all of general aviation. Access to any of Release 9's powerful capabilities is as simple as pressing the desired bi-directional page key. Pressing the same key in a desired direction navigates to the clearly labeled tabs with no more guessing as to what a given pilot input would do. Avidyne's Integra Release 9 is the next generation in fully integrated flight deck technology and the easiest to use page and tab user interface is just one of the many benefits designed to make your flying easier and safer. Most of them there were probably there from the press because they didn't think it would fly. And it, as it's depicted in the movie The Aviator, they all look surprised when all of a sudden it gets quiet and not bumpy. Do you yes. think that's really how it played? I know that's how it played because uh, you talk to people that were in the airplane that were engineers with Mr. Hughes. There were guys in the wings with fire bottles in case of, because there was no fire suppression system. And they were kind of peeking out through a hole in the firewall and all of a sudden the water went down below them and they're like, what are we doing here? There was a guy in the tail and uh, again, he got really surprised, what's happening here? It's quiet, what's going on? So some some of the press guys had gotten off. Some of them were still on the airplane. One of them interviews Mr. Hughes at the end and says, were you surprised? And Mr. Hughes says, no, I like to make surprises. Howard, did you expect that? Yes, certainly, I like to make surprises. You were surprised or not? I said, I thought I'd make a surprise. And so I think he surprised everybody. And as I said, I don't know when he intended to fly it, but I do think he surprised everyone by doing it that day. And probably deliberately. He wanted the government off his case, and he did it. Well, all I can say is we wouldn't have some of the marvels we have in the world, at least the man-made ones, if we didn't have a few fellow human beings who were a little off-center. <laughs> well, he really was a visionary and very much a terrific engineer and a very, very great man and a terrific aviator. But nonetheless, this is, I think, his culminating project of his life. And this airplane will always be associated with him. Uh, I think about teasing the kids that stay overnight in the museum about watching for the ghost of Mr. Hughes, but I don't tell them that. I'm afraid I'd have them awake all night. What am I saying? They don't sleep anyway. It's, <laughs> but uh, it's kind of fun. We do have kids that stay overnight and sleep under the tail, and that's, that, I think, a great opportunity for kids. Well, we'll have uh, anybody who's interested in seeing the Spruce Goose go to sprucegoose.org, sure. and they can get details on the plane and on this incredible museum that houses it. Larry, thanks for your time today. You betcha. Thank you for coming.